Hey Revolution Church, Pastor Jason here with my beautiful wife, Lindsay. And as most of you know, we took a trip to Africa a little over a month ago now with Serve International, one of our outreach partners, to be a part of feeding people there through Serve and also dedicating two church buildings that we helped fund and plant there in Kenya, as you heard more about last week. While we were there though, we also got to see two of our kids that we sponsor with another one of our outreach partners, Compassion International. And it's been amazing, not only to meet our kids, but just to see the impact that Compassion has on kids who live a life in poverty. So many times we feel helpless. Like what can we do to help kids who are in deep poverty? And with Compassion, that's a tangible way for us to be able to help. You know, Compassion meets the spiritual needs, the emotional needs, the physical needs of these kids in these different countries to help release them from poverty. Yeah, and, and probably the coolest thing about their model is they work with local churches. Yeah. And so they've got Compassion Projects at local churches in these uh, countries, in these cities all over the world where kids come and and they're discipled and they're fed. And like Lindsay said, they have all these needs met. Uh, and so it makes an incredible difference. I, I always say, I, I, it's amazing to me that Compassion does all of this on $38 a month of sponsorship. It's just incredible to see the work that they do. Um, but not only is it amazing for the impact that it has on the kids that you actually sponsor, but it's been amazing in our life to see the impact it's had on our own kids and sponsoring kids. Yeah, absolutely. It really helps them to have a global view of how big our God is. And we talk a lot about, you know, that us being able to sponsor these kids is helping release them from poverty and that we are sponsoring the next world leaders in these communities. And so it really gives us a great conversation to be able to have with our kids. And in our house, we have a big chalkboard that says, pray for our compassion kids. And it has the four kids names on there. And so we pass by that chalkboard every single day. So that means that we're having a conversation about our Compassion Kids. And it's honestly been life-changing for our kids to be able to be a part of um, sponsoring Compassion Kids. Absolutely. So at the end of the service today, you have an opportunity to come out into the lobby, pick up a, a packet and sponsor a kid. And maybe you'll sponsor more than one kid, whatever you feel like the Lord is leading you to do. But we just want to encourage you to, to make a difference in the life of a kid, to be a blessing, because God has blessed you. He has blessed us and he wants us to be a blessing. And this is an incredible way to be a part of what God is doing in the life of children all over the world. Absolutely. All right, like I said, right after service, you'll have an opportunity today to sponsor a child, and we'll talk more about that towards the end of the message. And so make sure that you take an opportunity and you listen, you pay attention to that right after service. Go ahead and plan to do that. Also, there's the Compassion Experience outside. It'll be here all day today, tomorrow as well. It's a good opportunity to kind of just experience a little bit what it means to be a kid in one of these situations, one of these global poverty situations and how we can make a tangible difference. Before we get into the message though, let's pray as we get started. God, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you're doing. God, I thank you for just the privilege and honor it is um, to be a part, to be a blessing. God, may we, like we talked about last week, understand the sheer joy that comes when we join you in what you're doing. And God, as we open up your word today, I pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears to hear, to see. And God, I pray that your word would have a, a profound effect on us as it does so often. As you said, it goes out and accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. And so God, I pray that it would do that today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a Bible, open it up to Genesis chapter 12 again. That's our verse for this series that we've been talking about over the last couple weeks. We'll hang out there for a little bit. Then we'll go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We were in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 last week. We're going to continue that conversation in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And we've been talking over the last several weeks, just in case you weren't here, I'll catch you up quickly. But even if you were here, you always need a refresher, all right? Um, because I know time changes last weekend. You're still dealing with that, still trying to catch up on that one hour of sleep. I get it. I've been that way all week. Uh, but we're in this series called Blessed and talking about the fact that God has blessed us in Christ, like Ephesians 1 says, with every spiritual blessing. He has blessed us 
And he has blessed us so that we will be a blessing. That's the whole concept that God told to Abram in Genesis chapter 12. So let's look at the key verse again. We'll unpack it a little bit more and then we'll move on to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. But Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God said to Abram this. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a what? Blessing. Blessing. That was pretty good. I got to say, if you're new, I like for you to call and respond. All right. So I know that you're alive out there. Let's try that again. So that you will be a what? Blessing. Blessing. I will bless those who bless you and it. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be what? Blessed. Blessed. That's where the series title came from. So God comes to Abram, right? Says, go, go from your land, go from your country. And again, we read these Bible stories. And if you're, especially on our Bible reading plan, I was doing my best to get caught up this week because I got a little behind. I'm a sinner too, just in case you wondered, right? And, and I thought that was funny, but I guess it wasn't. But, um, <laughs> The stories that we read, a lot of times we just move right past it, but you have to understand, again, like I've been saying, Abram at this point in time was 75 years old, 75 years old, no kids, and God says, I want you to go from your country, from your household, from your land, and go to a land I will show you. And so just imagine how daunting that thought was. Imagine how crazy that was to Abram. Like, say what? You want me to go? I'm 75. And how in the world are you going to make a nation out of me? We can't have kids. I don't know if you know this. And by the way, who the heck are you talking to me? Right? Like, we, we kind of misunderstand, I think, or, or don't fully understand the journey of faith that God took these people on. We know how it ends. But just imagine the faith that Abram had to say, okay, okay, I'll, I'll go. I'll trust you. And that's been my contention in this series is that God is taking all of us on a faith journey. God is taking us on a journey of, of belief where we first have to believe that God actually wants to bless us. We first have to have the faith to be like, all right, God, you really want to bless me. And that's what we talked about the first week, that being blessed and God's desire to bless us is far greater than we ever thought. So the first part of the journey is understanding, man, God wants to bless you. Almost like embarrassingly so. He gave you the greatest gift he could have ever given you. Not just the breath in your lungs, but his son. And so God wants to bless you. But then he wants to bless you so that you'll take this journey with him and be a blessing. And so this journey God wants to take all of us on is from being blessed to being a blessing. We call that very simply here the generosity journey. God wants to take us on this journey of generosity that begins with him being generous to us and then ends with us being generous to others. And my contention has been this. If you understand how generous God has been to you, you will have no problem being generous to others. That's just my contention. When you get how generous God has been to you, you will have no problem being generous to others. So that's the journey that we've been on for the last couple weeks. And I showed you last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 about these churches of Macedonia that Paul was talking about, which is the church of Philippi, the church of Thessalonica, and how the grace of God had been poured out on them so that in their severe affliction and their abundance of joy and extreme poverty, it overflowed in a wealth of generosity. And we talked about what it meant to be spiritually wealthy versus just physically wealthy. How they had an abundance of joy, yet they had extreme poverty, and it overflowed into a wealth of generosity. And I told you about how I love math, and that equation doesn't really make sense. Abundance of joy plus extreme poverty equals a wealth of generosity? Like, that plus that equals that? That doesn't make a lot of sense. In the same way, I'd say this to you. It doesn't make a lot of sense that we who aren't in extreme poverty, we don't have much joy and it doesn't equal generosity. The reverse of that equation doesn't make sense either. And that's Paul's whole contention to the Corinthian church. That, Listen, God has blessed you and he wants you to be a blessing. So let me give you a couple more principles today. So flip over now to 2 Corinthians chapter nine. Let me give you a couple more principles out of this 
verse of scripture, and then we'll talk about a specific way that you can be a blessing. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 is where we're going to be. So we'll go from verse 6 down to uh, at least verse 13, maybe 14 and 15 if we have time. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7, Paul says this. The point is this. Now, I love it when the Bible says that. I'm not the brightest, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the, in the tool, in the, in the drawer. Oh, see, I can't even say it. Like, I can't even get it out completely. The elevator didn't go all the way to the top. You know what I mean? So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, when he says the point is this, you know what? Um, okay. The point. Here, here's the point. All right? It's like Bill Ball. Here's your sign. Right? If you want to know, here's the point. And this is what he says. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, as we start, I want to say one thing. Again, a little bit of a disclaimer. My goal today is not to guilt you into anything. Nothing. Any, anytime we talked about this last week, I get it. Anytime a pastor starts talking about money, you start getting the shakes, right? Like you get a little tick in your face. You're like, mm, mm, mm. Like, I get it. No guilt, no compulsion, none of that. Why? Because God hates those kind of givers. He just said the kind that God loves. And so the opposite of that is God doesn't like it when they give out of guilt. And so there's no guilt today, nothing like that. I just want to share with you the gospel. I just want to share with you the principles. Again, how generous God has been to you. When you understand how generous God has been to you, very simply, I said, the contention is you'll be generous. But there's more principles that go along with that. And Paul just tells us one very simply. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly, reaps sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully, reaps bountifully. Let me say it to you another way. You can't reap what you don't sow. Very simply, Paul says this again in Galatians 6. You can't reap what you don't sow. <laughs> but you will reap what you do so. The toughest thing right now about being 39, and like I told you, September 12th, I turned 40, write that down, it's a great point, all right. The toughest thing about being 39 is I look back on my 25-year-old self with disdain. You know what I mean by that? Like, don't you wish you could go back to yourself a decade earlier and be like, what were you thinking? Do yourself a favor. Break up with him. Break up with her. Put the Twinkie down, right? Don't you wish you could do that? But the reason why we don't do that, and again, I'm, I'm just as guilty as anybody, is we forget the law of sowing and reaping. You reap what you sow. You don't reap what you don't sow. So, so listen, and I'm not saying bad things don't happen to us, things outside of our control. Again, I get all of that. But more often than not, we got nobody to blame but ourselves for where we currently are. And so the point very simply Paul is making is, listen, I want you in on the good stuff of what God is doing. And here's the promise. The promise is if you sow into the kingdom of God, you'll reap. You will reap a harvest. The more you sow, the more you reap. Again, think about it from a joy standpoint. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, peace, kindness, all those things. So that's why Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, sow to the Spirit. Why? Because if you sow to the Spirit, you reap the fruit of the Spirit. But if you sow to the flesh, you reap the fruit of the flesh. And what is that? It is death. I don't know about you. I would like less death and more life. Of course. Why wouldn't I? Right? I mean, I'm not insane, and hopefully you're not either. Very simply, and I got to be honest with you, and I'm going to do my best to passionately convince you that God is true, and his word is true, and he can be trusted, but I just got to be honest with you. I don't get Christians sometimes. I don't get Christians who will read verses like this and then won't do what it says, won't sow won't decide, won't be a generous giver. But I love how Paul says that. He says, for God loves 
a cheerful giver. That word cheerful is the Greek word, I've told you this before, literally, the Greek word hilaros, it's where we get our English word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. A hilarious giver. What does that mean? God loves people who laugh when they write a check. <laughs> Don't know if I got that, but here you go. You know what I'm saying when I say that? Like not the... <laughs> This is why I always joke, $20 at Target seems so small, but in the offering bucket seems so big. You know what Paul's saying here? It ain't the amount, it's the attitude. It's not the amount, it's the attitude. What's your attitude when it comes to this? What's your attitude? And again, this is what I just don't get with Christians a lot of times. They don't have an attitude about being generous in the same way that God has an attitude of generosity towards them. You know, that's God's, you know why God loves a cheerful giver? Because God himself is a cheerful giver. God gives hilariously. How? I've already said, he gave his son. He gave his son. It's the most ridiculous thing for God to do. To give his son, to give himself to a people that don't love who are his enemies. Why? I told you this is the first week. Because God had a bunch of kids he couldn't enjoy and he wanted them back. So God's a hilarious giver. Again, if you're a parent, you understand hilarious giving. You understand. You're like, <laughs> this is crazy. But you do it. Why? Because you love them. Here's my question. If God loves that kind of person, then why don't we love being that kind of person? Why don't we love being that kind of person? If that's what he loves, if that's what he loves, why wouldn't I want to do that? Why wouldn't I want to be that? Why would I not want to be the type of person that God wants me to be? Because I know if God wants me to be that, it's because God wants the best for me. How do I know God wants the best for me? Because God gave the best for me. Since he gave the best for me, I know he wants the best for me. And so why would I not want in on what God is doing? Because if I'm not in on what God is doing, guess what? I'm missing out on the potential harvest. I'm missing out on the impact that my life could have had. I'm missing out on what God is doing all over the world. So I love Paul's argument here. Not only does he argue in 2 Corinthians 8 about the gospel, listen, he, though he was rich, he became poor for your sake so that by, your, by his poverty you might become rich. That's the generosity of God and God saying now through Paul to us, God loves that kind of giver. So I don't know about you, but I wanna be the kind of person that God loves. And I'm not saying that again, it's some way that you gotta earn his love. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you love him, you'll wanna be what he loves. Now, Paul goes on. A couple, couple other principles I want to give you here, just in case you didn't believe me that God could be trusted. Look at verse 8. It's almost like Paul knows that our response. It's almost like Paul knows that we're going to say, well, if I sow and I give, what about me? Okay, look at verse 8. And God is able... To make all grace abound to who? That was good. Let's try that again. Abound to who? You, just in case you were wondering. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that, now listen to this, having all sufficiency in all things at all times. Does he cover pretty much everything there? So that you can have all sufficiency. That means so that you can have all you need in all things at all times. God, what about this? All things, all times. What about this? All things, all times. I'll make sure you have all you need. Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. I'll add those things to you as well. You think I can't add that? I bring people back from the dead. You don't think I can multiply that? As I was doing my Bible reading plan this week and get, trying to get caught up, I was laughing because Moses and the people of Israel were out in the wilderness and they were complaining because God was just giving manna all the time, which, you know, not that church people complain at all today. Not that that's any kind of a story that we could relate to, right? But they're eating manna and they're complaining about it. And they're having what I call cucumber dreams, thinking that slavery was much better. And then I, God says this, 
God says, are you complaining about manna? They wanted meat. No, I can, I can, I can, I'm down with that. I understand. And then God says this. All right, I'm going to give you meat. I'm going to give you so much meat till it's coming out your nostrils. Well, that's a lot of meat. Talking about the meat sweats, right? And then Moses says this to God. Moses says, uh, 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 hey, God, I don't know if you know this, but they're like 600,000 of us. How are you going to bring meat to feed 600,000 of us? And then I love God's response. He goes, you think my arms are too short to save? God's like saying, you think I'm T-Rex? You get me when I say that? You think I can't reach? Oh no, I can't bless my people. God says, watch this. And the next day it says, in the wind he brought quail. Praise God for quail, right? We might say he brought chicken. And then he feeds them. How? He's God. That's what he does. And I, and I got to wonder if Moses was like, my bad. Forgot you could bring quail to feed 600,000 people. Where do those quail come from? I don't know. God could have just said, quail, go. And then there's quail and they go. You forget God doesn't need raw materials to create anything. God doesn't need money in your checking account. God doesn't need blessings in your life already to somehow, okay, let's start with what you got. God's like, no, I'll give you what you don't even have. You think that's hard for me? Let's continue. I got to hurry here. All right. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. That phrase there, he has distributed freely, literally means he has distributed generously. He's distributed generously. You think he's going to have a problem continuing to do generous things? Look at verse 10. I love this. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and it's almost like this whole multiply thing we're doing is in the Bible. I don't know about you, but he will supply and multiply your seed. Now listen to this for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. He says, listen, the same God who supplied everything that you eat, he will supply. And not only that, he will multiply your seed. Now, here's the key for sowing. You will be enriched in every way. That word, I was actually like looking at that word and thinking, surely this is not what it means. But the word enriched means, you know what it means? To be made rich. Listen, God has no problem with you being made rich. No problem. I mean, embarrassingly so. You look at Abraham, you look at David, you look at anybody in the Old Testament that God blessed, they had stuff. But why did he bless them with stuff? So that they could sow into the kingdom. See, I used to think when I was a younger Christian that it was more holy to be poor. Some people have a prosperity mindset. You could also have a poverty mindset where you think that it's more godly to have nothing. Listen, it's, what did I say earlier? It's not about the amount. It's about the attitude. What's your attitude as you approach that? God has no problem enriching you in every way. Why? So that you can be generous in every way. In every way. That's not just finances, but surely it includes that. It's also your time. To be generous with your time. You know, we want people to join a team around here. We got Easter coming up. We're ser- we got six services. We need you to be generous with your time to serve people that have never heard the gospel. And listen, I get it. It's spring break week. But maybe you make a sacrifice to say, you know what? I'm going to be generous. Why? Because I want to sow into the kingdom. I can leave on vacation on Sunday. And so when I'm saying being generous in every way, please understand me. And I told you this last week when people are like, pastor just wants my money. No, we're not that shallow. We want way more than that. Way more. We want you, all of you. 
all your time, all your treasure, all your talents. Why? Because God gave all those to you to be a blessing to those who don't know him yet. That's the point. But here's what's amazing. He said it in their little key. He says, and I'll increase the harvest of your righteousness. The greatest joys of our life, Lindsay and I's life, is being a part of what God is doing, being able to be generous in what God is doing and seeing the fruit of it. Seeing the fruit of it. Seeing kids. We sponsor four kids with compassion. Two kids with serve. So we sponsor six kids every month. But you know what I love? You know it's a privilege to give? And I've met my four kids, met the two kids. We've met all six of them. I see the impact it has on their life. And that, the harvest of that, brings far greater joy than getting new shoes, getting new sunglasses. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying when I say that? The harvest of investing in what God is doing all over the world. The fruit of that is the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy. That is far, far more joyful than anything else. Now, a couple more verses. We, we gotta go, because I gotta, we got something cool to show you. 2 Corinthians 9, listen to this, verse 12. He says, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. Verse 13, by their approval of this service, he's talking about the people that will be blessed by the offering he's taking up, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. What does he mean there? He's saying, listen, you gotta understand. They will glorify God because you submitted to the gospel. They will glorify God because you submit it. Your submission masks your confession. Again, this is where I just struggle sometimes with Christians who have confessed God, but they don't want to submit to him. As if that, that you could do that. People say, he's my savior. He's not my Lord. Listen, he didn't agree to that agreement. So if he ain't your Lord, he ain't your savior. That's just how it is. It's all or nothing. If God doesn't have all of you, he doesn't have any of you. Now listen, this is when you're like, oh no, am I not saved? Listen, I'm not trying to convince you you're not saved. Here's what I'm just showing you. This is what saved people do. Saved people submit to their confession. I confess you as Lord and Savior of my life. What does that mean? You own it all. My whole life is an opportunity to glorify you, to submit to you. And I'll do that because of the harvest that it brings. And what is the harvest? The harvest is people. The harvest is people glorifying God. Listen, man, if you'll get in on that, you'll have so much greater joy. And that's what, not only being in Africa, because Lindsay and I have been several times, but when you see people glorifying God, and you know that God was gracious enough to you to let you in on experiencing that, it ruins you, and you're like, I want more. So I want to show, speaking of compassion specifically, I want to show you a story of a kid's life who was radically changed, radically changed by someone simply being willing to sponsor a kid. You guys check this out. There's so much that I got from compassion, things that so dear to me, things that you can never take away from me. And one of the things that I got from compassion was love. My name is Jay Mbiro. I was born in Matare, Nairobi, Kenya. Growing up as a kid in Matare was not easy. I grew up hungry, without clothes most of the time, without shoes. And as a little boy, I went to the streets of Nairobi and I started begging for food and money. It was one day that I begged the whole day and I didn't have anything. Nobody gave me anything. I saw a woman with a purse 
and I actually went ahead and, and took it from them and I ran. But I was not lucky enough because I was arrested. That's when I went to prison at the age of nine. I remember kneeling down in prison and I prayed to God. And I said, God, if you exist, please take me out of this prison. I don't want this life. I don't want to live this life anymore. And when you get me out of prison, please get me out of poverty. Because poverty is going to bring me back to this place. When I went back home, I didn't see any hope. I didn't see anything that, that had changed. One day I just went to, to school and my teacher called me. And she said, you are one of the kids that have been selected to actually join Compassion. And I could not believe it. I was super excited. And I remember taking the news home and telling my parents that I've been selected to be one of the kids who are going to join Compassion Center. My life was going to be different. It was such a blessing to get into Compassion. Compassion introduced me to Jesus, and I got to know that if anything else in this world fails, the Word of God will never fail. And it is through Compassion International that I can now stand here and say that God actually had a plan for me. God actually, all along, He knew about me, and He knew my name. And that's why I'm alive right now. I'm a DJ now. I live in Atlanta, Georgia, and I DJ as a ministry. And to me, it's just a way of saying to people who helped me, to my sponsor, thank you. My name is Jay Miro, and I am a life changed. All right, everybody, I want to introduce you to Jay Mbiro. <laughs> hey. Thank you so much. Yeah, L little did you know that the guy that you saw on video is actually here with us in person. We did that on purpose, surprise. <laughs> and here's the coolest thing. When we were in Kenya last, mo uh, yeah, last month, we visited a place, uh, there's two big, big slums in Nairobi, and we visited one called Mathera Slum, and there's a, a ministry there that Serve works with, and so we were there for uh, a few hours, and it was r literally overwhelming. And when we were, Jay and I were talking, he actually is from the exact same slum that we visited a month ago. And even the lady that I was, we were talking about the ministry that we were there, he's like, oh, I know that, I showed him a picture, he said, I know that lady. And that wasn't his compassion project, but he said, I grew up, what, not very far from there. Right. Uh, and so going there, I wanted him just to share a little bit. I mean, you heard it, but what was it like being in a slum in a poverty situation like that? Well, it's so much I can say about that. But uh, in a nutshell, Madara is one of those places like we were in, in our own world. And in a world that we were so poor and we knew that nobody cared about us. And one thing about Madara is that when kids are born in that place, Usually the boys are expected to be thieves and the girls are expected to be prostitutes. And usually they say nothing good that can come out of Matare. Our parents didn't go to school. We tried to go through school, but we can't make it. And so eventually, no matter how hard I try, I'll end up becoming a thief. And that happened to me at some point. And it's one of those places where kids are hopeless. They don't have a future. Literally having a pair of shoes is a miracle. Having a plate of food is the biggest miracle. And that would happen every now and then where you're coming home, you're expecting to find something to eat. And I've been here for some time. I know there's a lot of food in America. <laughs> and we're coming home and the room is cold because there was nothing that was cooked. That is just one of the most devastating things, especially as a young kid. Because as a young kid, you don't know you're poor. But then you don't have anything to eat. You have to go to bed hungry. And so that happened and over and over again. And it's one of those places where you're like, you know what? I give up. I have to become a thief. And that's how I became a thief at the age of nine. Hmm. Yep. And so after that, you went to prison Correct. at nine. How long were you there? Well, I was there close to a year. Wow. Yeah. And what happened is that uh, when you're in the street, I was actually begging, but I was not begging for myself. I had a whole family back at home who were expecting me to, because at first I, I didn't start by stealing. I started by begging. And so I was begging, hoping to get something to take home so that my family can be fed. Yeah. And so I would beg, take money home, and when I could not get any, anything in the streets, that's when I started stealing. And I became a thief. And in Kenya, when you're stealing, you can either be shot 
you can be stoned, you can be burned to death, you can be arrested. And so I was kind of lucky to be arrested. That is hard to say, but I was lucky because I didn't die. Yeah. Yeah. So then after you came back from prison, you know, and who was it that told you about, it was your teacher you said about being a compassion kid? Yeah, but actually how that happened is while I was in prison, because uh, one of the ways to get out of prison is you pay your way out, but of course, like bribes, that's what, and, yeah. like bribe. But of course I was there because we didn't have money, so that was not an option. The second option was if your family is like a big family that is well known, they can talk to somebody. That one is not happening. And so the only option that I was left, even though I was not a believer, I knelt down right there in prison and I prayed to God. Mm. And I remember asking God for two things. One, I wanted to get out of prison so bad because I had seen kids dying in the same prison and I didn't want to die. But the second thing I prayed to God to get me out of poverty. Mm. And so I had, after I got out of prison, which was a big miracle, I remember going home and I was with my grandma. I was staying with my grandma because my mom had attempted suicide mm. after all that was happening. And so we were staying with my grandma and my grandma insisted, hey, let's go to school, even though we didn't have money. And I was trying to argue with my grandma, and you never do that. <laughs> <laughs> never argue with the grandma. Yeah. But then my grandma insisted, hey, let's go to school. And it so happened that the time that we went to school, it's just a time that compassion was coming around to look for students who are in school. They want to be in school, but they don't have the money. And so that's why they, and they ask us a lot of questions that to make sure that they sponsor the poor of the poorest. Yeah. And that's one of the best things. I was glad to be poor one, one time in my life. Because yeah. that got me into a program of compassion which literally changed my life. And that's why I joined the program of compassion. Mm. Yeah. So why would you tell these guys here to you know, make a sacrifice and sponsor a child? Well, I think you just nailed it with the, uh, Second Corinthians 9. Like by them submitting to the gospel, they make people like us praise God and bless God and lift God. And as, you, as you've heard from my story, from the video and everything, honestly, if, if nobody picked my packet and sponsored me, if I didn't get into that program, how I can see my life would be, because I can look at my friends. Like I said, I was in Kenya in November and I couldn't find my friends because they're either in prison or they are dead. Mm. And so sponsoring to me, it, not, it did not just uh, give me food and shoes, which was cool and I love a lot of food, but it saved my life. Yeah. And you know, there are two kinds of poverty. There's a physical poverty, but there's a spiritual poverty, which is common to everybody, whether you have money or not. But when you sponsor these children, if you don't give them anything else, you give them Jesus, who is the hope of glory. Yeah. And if you're, going to, if you're thinking about sponsoring, if you're thinking of praying, I would advise you don't pray, because God will never say no. Yeah. <laughs> this he gave me Jesus, and he gave me my life. So go right there and sponsor children, and let's make a difference. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Thank you so much. Um, Jay will be out after service uh, at the Compassion Tables if you want to meet him, talk to him. Uh, but I just wanted you to see that they're real kids with real stories. And of course, he's not a kid anymore. Right. And, um, but it literally does change a life. And so thank you, Jay. I appreciate that. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so response time today will be a little bit different. Obviously, still give you a chance to respond to the gospel, and um, we'll do that in just a second when I pray. But then after that, please, um, like he said, it's not really something you have to pray about, um, but it's not a way to guilt you either. I just want you to know from our church, before this weekend, our church already sponsors 873 Compassion Kids. Our church, 873, yeah. And so this weekend, we have an opportunity to go over 1,000. If we do that, we will be in the top 10 largest sponsorships of all the churches in the Southeast United States. And the most amazing thing about that is every church that's on that list normally runs over about 10,000 people. So we're one of the smallest churches on that list but sponsoring the most amount of kids. And that's because you're generous. So I wanna say thank you for doing that, for those of you that sponsor, but also to say it's an opportunity to continue to be generous in the way that God has been generous to us. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. Thank you for Jesus. 
for being generous to us because without Jesus, without you giving the greatest gift, none of us would have any hope. And not just physically speaking, like we heard in Jay's story, but spiritually, like he said. And so that's the greatest gift is Jesus. And so God, I pray right now for anybody in the house or watching or listening who's never trusted Jesus, who's never understood how generous you have been to them. I pray right now you would save them. Nobody looking around or talking here as we close. If you've never trusted Christ, never taken that step of saying, I want to go on this journey with you. I believe you. Will you forgive me? I'm going to lead you in a prayer to yourself, not out loud. We're not trying to embarrass you. This is ultimately between you and God. We do want to celebrate it, though. And if you want to trust Christ for the first time, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Like I said, it goes like this. Say, God, thank you for loving me, that you sent your son Jesus in my place for my sin. I give you my life. I ask you to save me, forgive me. Thank you for loving me. Now, again, nobody looking around or talking. If you just prayed that, we want to know and celebrate that, like I said. So if you just trusted Christ, would you just simply lift your hand up so we can see that? Just lift it up. Thank you. We got men and women going to walk around, put a gift in your hands, a Bible from us. When you get that, you can put your hand down. We want to give you a gift. And then, like I said, for those of us who've already trusted Christ, you have, not, you have an opportunity right after service to go out, sponsor a kid. We've got three different countries that we work in, Haiti, the DR, and Kenya. And those are all out in the lobby, separated by country. So please take a moment and go look and just ask the Lord what he would have you to do. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for being generous to us. Thank you for blessing us so that we can be a blessing. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.